My moment of serendipity happened just meters from this exact theatre. I was bicycling from my home in Ditchling Rise towards the seafront when a white van just in front of me suddenly I realised was about to swing out of his slow moving traffic into my path in the bike lane. I was completely unseen. I wish that I'd had a presence travelling just in front of me. A virtual me, if you like, travelling in front of me to warn cars that I was approaching. That was my moment of serendipitous innovation. And I dreamed up the laser light. The laser light is designed to tackle the most common cause of cyclist fatality, which is being caught in the blind spot or a driver turning across a bike they can't see. It is a front light, required after dark by law, but it also has a green laser, and it projects the symbol of a bike just in front of you onto the road. So the driver in front can see that you're coming and doesn't turn across your path. It also gives a helpful heads up to a pedestrian with a head down about to step out of the pavement. The laser light began here. I designed it as my final year project at the University of Brighton. I was previously studying, Ox studying physics at Oxford University, but left to pursue something more tangible and more creative. We now have a small team based in East London. We have raised about £1.5 million from investors such as the Branson family and Index Ventures. We have a global supply chain. We're shipping the laser light to over 55 different countries around the world. And we're stocked in retailers, such as Evan Cycles and in the MoMA Design Store in New York. We launched our second product, The Burner, just before Christmas, a backlight. We launched it on Kickstarter, and we wanted to raise £35,000 in a month. We did that in the first day. We went on to raise £153,000. But the most exciting news for Blaze came at the end of last year when we announced that our laser technology is being integrated into all of the Santander cycles, or Boris bikes, in London. TfL conducted some in-depth research. They commissioned TRL, who's the Transport Research Laboratory, to conduct many experiments. They tested the effectiveness of the laser light around HGVs, buses, vans, cars, and different light conditions and different road surfaces. It was a lengthy process, and I was very nervous because I wasn't allowed to be involved at all. But they submitted a 92-page document with some amazing findings. Things like a bike with a laser light in pitch black is more visible than a bike without in broad daylight. It decreases the blind spot of an HGV by over 25% and a van by over 30. The laser light is a very simple idea. Um, the, laser, sorry, the laser light is a very simple idea, uh, but it's now proven to be effective, and it's crazy enough to be a radical innovation. Now, there's long been comparisons between serendipity and innovations in science and technology. For example, Alexander Fleming and his accidental discovery of penicillin. Albert Hoffman and his possibly surprising discovery of the hallucinogenic effects of LSD when trying to find a drug to cure a migraine. And Percy Spencer and his accidental invention of the microwave. Perhaps that moment that sparks the innovative innovation and serendipity can also be called the Eureka moment, and no more obvious with the example of Arch Archimedes when he leapt out of his bath and realised that the volume of water that he displaced was equal to the volume of his body. Now, but are these moments all true examples of serendipity? Would these things and these creations and these innovations have happened without that one unusual moment? Or are they just a clear example of a memorable, unusual moment of conception. Would Newton have discovered gravity has his proverbial apple not fallen on his head? 
Now, I am by no means drawing direct conclusions between the fundamental laws of physics and my own invention. But without the presence of Archimedes and the ability to ask him the question, and only able to draw on my own examples, I find it really hard to imagine creating the laser light without my eureka moment 50 yards from this building and that white van. Now, I do not believe that any of these examples occurred purely out of an unusual moment, but instead, that eureka moment combined with many, many weeks, if not decades, of research into a specific problem. Mine came on my first day of university. I just spent the summer cycling the length of the UK for charity, and I came back to university with a theme, urban cycling. I had my idea. It was brilliant. I was going to do brake lights for bikes. I ran into my course leader's uh, classroom, Mr. Morris, and said, Mr. Morris, I've got to tell you about my brilliant idea. He didn't believe me. He said, I don't think you're tackling an actual problem. Go away and do the research and really understand the problem you want to solve before you come at me with a solution. So I went away absolutely furious and determined to prove him wrong. I gave myself the theme, urban cycling, and I then gave myself the challenge. I wanted to find the biggest problem for city cyclists. I didn't care if it was getting wet, or your bike nicked, or losing your way. But it had to be the biggest problem. After kicking off some research, I quickly identified that personal safety was the biggest challenge for city cyclists. Then, after weeks of deep diving in the statistics of which accidents most commonly happen and which scenarios, the fact that being caught in the blind spot or a vehicle turning across a bike they can't see is by far the most common cause of fatality. I then spent six months working with a dri driving psychologist in Sussex. I worked with the Brighton & Hove bus company. I spent many, many hours bicycling around town with a GoPro strapped to my head all in the quest to understand the problem first, before I found that solution, and before I found that white van. So that was one of the most important pieces of advice I think I will ever receive in my life, to really, really deep dive into a problem before you find a valuable solution. I propose that perhaps that is one of the first conditions of true innovation and serendipity, to really, really understand a problem first. Newton was dedicated to understanding why the moon was pulled to the earth. Fleming spent his life looking at bacteria. And Archimedes was determined to understand how to find the volume of an irregular object. I believe the second most important condition is being able to spot the crazy. For example, I don't believe Archimedes. Um, yeah, scientists um, will, well, will acknowledge the fact that serendipitous events can create objects of real value. They conduct experiments with very, very tight parameters in order to quickly spot what's unusual and explore that. Call it curiosity, if you like. Newton didn't eat his apple. Archimedes didn't get out of the bath, dry himself, and carry on with his day. And Fleming didn't throw away that petri dish. Nor did I discard the really crazy idea of strapping a laser to a bicycle to help it be more visible. So I'll leave you with a final example of serendipitous innovation. Pfizer, the drug company, were looking for a drug to treat angina, the painful heart condition. They wanted something to increase the blood flow to the heart. Instead, what they found was a lot of the male test companies, test patients, discovering that blood flowed to another area. They called that drug Viagra. <laughs> 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 
And so to conclude, I'd like to suggest that to create serendipitous innovation, there needs to be two conditions. One, the will to really, really understand and go deep on a problem. And two, be open and willing to, to, to discover and then explore the crazy within it. Thank you.